you, Jesus. Uh, we thank you that tonight we can come and walk in your word and that you will walk along beside us. And I would ask, Lord, that you would send the Holy Spirit, that he not only would comfort us, but he would guide us tonight. And that as we get into the really hard stuff, that you would illuminate things that we've never even thought of before. I just know you are just like that. You are mighty and wondrous and glorious, and we thank you. We thank you most of all for your son. We love you, and we ask that you would be our present help tonight in our study of Mr. Jeremiah. Amen. We are in Jeremiah 2. We're going to try to get through through chapter 4. The sections of Jeremiah are not like most books. It won't be that I can give you an outline of Jeremiah. There is no such creature out there. In fact, for every scholar that you search Jeremiah out, you'll see that person have a different outline. It's not linear. It's not in chronological order. It's not in any certain way by themes or titles. It is sort of like a conglomeration of 30 years of writing. And what happened, we'll, we find out in his life, he Tonight we're going to be in the era of good King Josiah because he's going to tell us. There are other writings he does. We're not exactly sure when he wrote it. We get a hint by some of the kings of Judah that he's mentioning. But what we're going to find is that there, there came a time when all his writings were destroyed by the king in charge. And Baruch, his writer, who is his scribe, had to hustle and they had to rethink and rewrite and it's almost like some of them are quickly jotted down as Jeremiah remembered them. And so you're going to see kind of a difference in styles of writing. Those that were not destroyed are very eloquent, remind you of Isaiah who was known as the Shakespeare of the Bible. There's others you think, oh my gosh, this is like the Apostle John who wrote Revelation by saying, I saw this. Then I saw this. I saw this. Oh, yes. I don't want to forget. I saw this. And it's like this round robin of ideas, not in a chronological order, which Revelation is not. Same way with this book. So he reminds me of the Apostle John a lot. And yet he's very much like Isaiah. Of course, he's his own man. He's going to be in the era of Josiah and four other kings. And we're going to name him as we go through him. If you have last week's notes, you'll have a list of all of Judah's kings. At this point in history in Israel, the northern kingdom has been taken captive 150 years prior. We see what happened after um, Solomon died. There was a civil war for Israel, and it split into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern. And I always, just to be silly, say northern bad, southern good, and that's kind of a simple way of explaining uh, simplistically what happened. The ten northern tribes w became the head of idolatry, and they put two different shrines for the bull and, and Canaanite deities, and they really forsook God, and God was angry. And so he allowed the Assyrians, who were the head of the world at the time, to take the northern kingdom captive in about 722 B.C. Now 150 years have passed. They've already been taken captive. So Jeremiah's message is to the southern kingdom, to Benjamin, to Levi, and to some of the ten tribe good people that filtered down. He's saying, you should have, tonight he's saying, he's going to say to them, you should have known better. You saw what happened to the northern kingdom, and you had 150 years to get this right. Now God's going to take you too. Jeremiah's message is not popular because he's telling his countrymen, you're gone too. Assyria has dissolved because a guy, a new guy on the block named Nebuchadnezzar, has come up through the ranks bit by bit. Um, I would say probably if you had to look at war, war statisticians, Nebuchadnezzar would be at the top. He picked off little villages one by one, and nobody paid attention to him until his army was massing about three million men. And then he began to be unstoppable. And he took the big guy off the block, which was Assyria, and now Babylon is the king of the world. And that Nebuchadnezzar's group, that Babylonian Chaldean group, is coming to get Judah, which is the Benjamin, Judah, Levites, those bottom tribes. We call them Judah. And they are going to be taken captive, and Jeremiah knows it. And so his message to them throughout this whole book is going to be, it's too late. 
give up. You're going to be taken captive. That's just how it is. Now, at the same time he's prophesying, there are lots of other guys prophesying. We have a guy you may have known in the south named Daniel. He's in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. He's prophesying. You may have heard of another friend of ours named Ezekiel. He's in the northern area around the, the Chebar Reservoir. He's prophesying. And then Jeremiah's prophesying from the town of Jerusalem. So you've got these three big guns of, of prophets, three of the four major prophets. Isaiah prophesied 150 years before. So they know his work. So they're feeding off that as well. So that's kind of the, I always like to tell you kind of the history of where you're at. This is the longest book in the Bible by content, not by chapter and verse. Because, of course, man made that, <clears throat> not God. And what you're going to find is, I can easily say this, and I think that I can prove it, is the most misunderstood book in the Bible, the most misread, and the most understudied of any book in the entire Bible. You will go to a church, and I would guess, according to everything I read, 98% of the churches have never done a study on the book of Jeremiah. 98%. And this is in the Western world, America, Canada, I'm not talking about Hindus. I'm talking about, quote, 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 Christian America. So you're in a real small company studying him, but I think you're going to find you're going to fall in love with this guy. He is never allowed to marry, and he's totally sold out to God. His message is so hard that everyone that hears, his, hears it that is against God wants to kill him, throw him in wells, tromp him, you name it, and God protects him. He goes through the whole last group of the kings of Judah, and he withstands them all, even until Zedekiah is taken away. Taken away. And what you're going to find is that you never see him ever waver. The last thing I will say, and then we're going to go on, because I'll add more as we go, but um, we don't know what happened to him. He's never taken captive. He never goes into Chaldea with the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar never, take, never takes him. Um, he's not with Ezekiel. He's not with Daniel. We do think he escapes maybe with the very last pseudo king named Gedaliah who went, who hid in Egypt. Maybe we're not sure. So he's one of those wonder what if, if you find the answer to that, please tell us because we'll make a lot of money writing a book because <laughs> that's a, that's a question no one knows for sure. And we're going to get into a really difficult section tonight that I will say, I found no scholars that can explain it. So if that whets your appetite a bit, there's one verse here that no one can explain. Maybe God will show you the answer. The Holy Spirit's awesome. So we're going to continue on. I'm in Jeremiah 2, and I'm in the first verse. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord God, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal when you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will become upon them, says the Lord. The Lord is thinking back. There are going to be parts in this first dissertation where the Lord is going to take on the role of a prosecuting attorney. And he's going to set up the case, and then he's going to prosecute it. And what he's basically saying through the mouth of Jeremiah to the people that are listening in Judah He's saying, I remember when you loved me. In the wilderness, when you were dependent on me, when I brought you up from Egypt and you walked with me 40 years in the wilderness, I remember when you loved me. I remember at the bottom of Mount Sinai when I gave you the Ten Commandments and after you messed up with Aaron, then you came back to me. You came back to me with all your heart. I remember that. You're going to catch this theme in other places. Paul remembers that in Ephesians. The Apostle John talks about in the letters to Revelation, when he talks to the church of Ephesus, he tells him, do not forget your first love. This theme is going to be up. This whole first part of Jeremiah is God said, I remember when you loved me, when you loved me. And God is setting up the case because he's going to prosecute him pretty hard. So remember that as you, as you kind of pick that apart. Remember also, this is not going to be a necessarily in chronological order. It's going to be as Jeremiah gets it from God and writes it down. So when we put a, a kind of a stamp on some of this, chapters 2 through 6 seem to be kind of a theme. 
They kind of seem to go together if you were going to group them. However, because of the way I talk and how long things take, I didn't think you wanted to stay till tomorrow till we did chapters two through six. But if I were lumping them, I'd do one as the intro and I'd do two through six as a group. We're not going to get that far tonight. But that gives you kind of an idea of the section you're going into. <clears throat> the reign of Josiah, for those of you that are history buffs and like to know that, so you know the time span we're talking about, was about 31 years. And if you like dates, which I do, 640 B.C., to about 609 BC. We know that without a doubt. Josephus records this Herodotus. If you believe in history at all, there's very well annaled about the dates of the king. So we're in 640 years before Jesus is about what we're looking at right now, that he's writing that. So that gives you a pretty good glimpse of where we're at in history. Remember too, just, I, I don't want to beat this dead horse, but it, with the 12 tribes of Israel, they did split into northern and southern, north bad, south good. But there were lots of good people in the north from all those 10 tribes that did not want to do idolatry and worship. And they began to filter south. And so remnants of each of those tribes began to filter into the southern kingdom. So that if anyone tells you, well, there's the 10 lost tribes of of Israel, they were taken captive by Assyria, never to be seen again. Yeah, that's true, they were taken captive by Assyria, never to be seen again, but there were some remnants of each of those tribes that had filtered down, and they're here now. They're, they've assimilated into Benjamin, into Judah, into Levi, and they're kind of they're kind of part of them. So the, and I got that not just out of my brain. Second Chronicles 11, 13 through 16 is the part you need to know about that so that you understand the documentation is in the Bible that explains that too. I'm continuing on now. I'm back to Jeremiah 2, verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. This is how you know some of those filtered south. He's speaking to all the tribes. There is a remnant from each of those ten that got taken captive that were good and filtered out. He's speaking to the whole shebang here. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters? Neither did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt? Remember, he's the prosecuting attorney. And this is God speaking. Look, the very first thing he says, I think it's very telling. He says, what, ha what injustice have you and your fathers found in me? What have I done wrong? Can you imagine the God of this universe coming to you if you were in idolatry and sin and say, what did I ever do wrong with you that you're sinning against me? This is the care he loves this people with. If it were me, I'd zap them and destroy them and they'd be gone. But he gave his promise. He gave his promise to Abraham a long time ago. And he won't go against his word for anyone. So he's going to plead his case to these people. And he said, what injustice did I ever do to your fathers or to you that you have deserted me? And when you think of it like that, it's almost a heartbreaker. That's almost a tearjerker to me that my God loves us so much. That even in this Old Testament setting, 640 years before Jesus, he's beginning to make a way for his son. Picture this. He's beginning to give them a way out of their sin. The only way out is Jesus. We're starting to see him begin to suggest that he's sending the Messiah. I, I think it's a heartbreaker if you really pick that apart. I'm continuing on. <coughs> Verse 7, I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Abomination is always a clue. And this is when you know keywords in the Bible. When God uses that, it's sexual sin having to do with idols. The Canaanite religion, which they were practicing in the promised land, was sponsored by someone you know to hate, Jezebel. And her father from Sidon, who were Nephilim and worshipping Canaan, Shemosh, Baal. And there was always harlots 
in the temple and it was sexual sin on the groves and the mountains and that's why when you saw when he mentions trees and groves and abomination it's Canaanite based sexual sin that has to do with the religion and Judah and Israel were so steeped in that that he took the ten northern tribes never to be seen again and now it's filtered down you know sin does it never stays put. It's filtered down to these southern ones, and they're starting to do it. And God said, what did I ever do to you that this is how you repay me? It's an abomination. That's a key word. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law, this is the, their priests. Their, their religious people were, in, were including this abominations in their worship did not know me. The rulers have transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. He is, he is going to lay a case out pretty, pretty strong here. Just so you understand time slot of this, because I think it helps historically. It's been 800 years since the Exodus. And they have gone the way of the world. They've gone into Canaanite religion. They've gone into sexual sin. They're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping Shemosh. They're worshiping ungodly idols. Now, that leads us to the question, it's not for tonight. If you're reading the book, The Unseen Realm, by um, Dr. Michael Hauser, like I am, you'll understand that probably Baal was a f one of the fallen angels. And they, he probably walked among the people originally. They probably saw him. And then they made statues that represented him and worshipped him. And that's probably, where that, that's probably where the root of all this comes from. It's when the fallen angels came to earth and did all their damage. And it, and it just continues on. Um, he was a Phoenician god. And he is also known as a destroyer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that um, we're going to do a little style change now. God's kind of laid that out. He's going to you know, set that up as, as a good lawyer would. Now he's going to do a shift. So just pay attention. I'm in verse 9. <clears throat> Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, said the Lord, and against your children's children will I bring charges. For pass beyond the coasts of Cyprus and see, send a Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. You ever heard the phrase, phrase, be afraid, be very afraid? That's where this comes from. God's telling Israel, you do stuff even pagan nations don't do. Pagan nations don't give up their idols. They worship them for thousands of years. Look at Baal. Nobody changes their God for him. They just keep keeping him. And you throw me away. And this is when now, he's remember, he set up the case. And now he's getting into the hard stuff. And the, I love this. I summed, When I write little summations by my Bible, I wrote, Be afraid. Be very afraid. Because that's what he tells them. Be afraid. Be very afraid what's coming. That change of style is going to hit hard now. I am in verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The two sins were they not only rejected God, which is good, they brought in the bad. I want to go just step back up. I, I should have explained to you when it when it did the explanation from Cyprus to Kedar. That's a geo, geographic thing. It's like saying from California to the coast of Maine. It's from east to west. The whole expanse. In other words, the whole country I gave you, you've done this on. There's not one place that you haven't defiled. So from east to west is what he's basically saying. And if you geographically looked at that you would know um, on a historical map. Continue on then. Um, on that two evils thing, on that two evils thing, I want to uh, remind you that 
it's not only bad enough that you reject God. If that's bad. Oh, believe me, that's bad. But then when you bring in the evil to go with it, that's like double damnity for them. Now, continuing on, um, I want you to I want you to um, underline four words: fountain of living waters. In that, because that's not the first time you're ever going to hear that. Isaiah spoke it 150 years before in Isaiah 12 and also in Isaiah 55. We're not going to go to tonight, but if you're a nitpicker and want to go back. But here's what I want you to know. I'm going to bring this to Jesus' time. Now remember, we're, to, we're looking at 650 years before Jesus is born. What does Jesus call himself? I'm going to take you to John 4:14. 4, but whoever... No, uh, let me set you up for the scene of this. Do you remember the scene at the well? Jesus takes a side trip with his disciples into Samaria, which no Jew ever did. Samaria were the non-Jews, the I would say the bastard Jews, because they were the Jews that stayed back, that wouldn't, that hid in the hills, and then they intermarried with the Assyrians and the Babylonians. So they're all mixed with all the evil things and kind of half Jews. But Jesus decided to take his disciples on a side trip. He had an appointment with a woman at a well. And he changed her life. And here's what I want you to remember. In John 4.14, he says to her, after he asked for water, he says, But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in John 7.38, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, Note that as Scripture has said, he's referring back to Jeremiah. Jesus is quoting Jeremiah. At this point, he's quoting this that we're reading right now. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. Did you know that Jesus quoted Jeremiah? Let's go back and read verse 13 again. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Jesus calls himself that. God's calling himself that in Jeremiah. Might we say God and Jesus are the same? Absolutely. And are they separate? Yes. Do I understand how that is? No, but I believe it. God and Jesus are the living fountain. And when Jesus makes that side trip into Samaria, he quotes to that woman this passage in Jeremiah. And he says to her, oh yeah, you're not married. You have seven other guys that you were married to. Yes, right, you're not. But I can give you the fountain of living water. And because of him making that side trip and her receiving him, she brings the whole town to Jesus, the Samaritans who were hated. Jesus came for the hated. I think it's just, I, I think when you understand the Old Testament and the New Testament are inseparable, it makes it all that richer. I'm continuing on in verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he plundered? The young lions roared at him and growled. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the people of Noph and Tophanes have broken the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourself? And that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now why take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Sahor? Or why take the road to Syria to drink the waters of the river? Your own wickedness will correct you. And your backsliders will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God. And the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. There's a lot of things in that one. Uh, when you talk about, there's two things that are he's referring to here. Let's get some some terms first. Sihor, the waters of Sihor, that's the Nile River. So if you want to write Nile beside it, that's what it means. The other things he talks about, Noph was a city in Egypt called Memphis. It's, we more remember it as ancient Memphis. And when they do the Moth to Timophanes, that's north to south. The whole region of Egypt. That's that's him saying geographically, it's the whole thing, like we did before in the other synecdoche that we talked about. When he's talking about Assyria, the drink, the river, that's the Euphrates River. That's what runs through Assyria, the Euphrates River. So you should know that. Jews would have known that. Now, when he says basically, when, uh, when he led you in the way, when he led them up out of captivity, that's what he's meaning. When he took them up 
and he rescued them. He keeps pointing back to that rescue away from Egypt, out of captivity. That's what that reference is to. The exodus out of Egypt. That was a huge deal for them, and they totally forgot it. And I also want to remind you that the real sin here is not the, it's not the idols. It's not the sex. It's not the worship. It's, he narrows it down to one phrase that he's going to hound you on. You have forsaken the Lord your God. Earlier on, when he was being milder in his first defense, to first, he said, you have forgotten your first love. And now he's just spelling it out. You have forsaken me. Not only have you forgotten me, you've just you've walked away. You have forsaken the Lord your God and the fear of the Lord. I want, I want you to also know that here is a place where we're going to talk about a lot. The Lord God of hosts. He is not only the God of this universe. He has a host of angelic created beings that follow him. And they are at his bid and call. And we don't talk about that much in the cream puff kind of religion that we're used to in America. These guys are big guys. They're not all angels. There's other creatures. They're called the host. But this is the Lord of hosts. And he, God is his name. So continuing on, I think I've explained most of those terminologies to you about the Nile River and the Euphrates. Okay, verse 20. For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds. And you said, I will not transgress. When on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. See, that was part of the religion. You will note, when God demanded the temple be built, never built it around trees. There's a bad thing about trees in the Bible. Trees are not a good thing. And it's like I told you about birds. There's certain words you're going to pick up. Abominations. You're going to pick up on birds. You're going to pick up on trees. When God talks about trees, it's in a negative fashion. The Matthew parable about the birds coming and picking the seeds and and the birds are bad, and then there's a, the tree that grows from the mustard seed. You need to restudy that because it's not the typical what you think. And I will remind you that it even comes to culmination as Christ is crucified on a tree. I guess I make my point, don't I? Mm -hmm. So when he's talking here, they use trees to have phallic symbols carved out of them, to have sex under them, to have babies murdered under them. They were awful in the Canaanite religion, and they always wanted the high hills, and they always wanted groves of trees. I think they thought they were hidden if they were in a grove of tree, but God saw them, and he was reminding you, I watched you. I saw you. It's, it's horrible. So I can't make it enough emphasis. Do you need to understand what that religion was like? Yet I have planted you a noble vine, a seed of the highest quality. Often Israel is referred to as a vine, very seldom as a tree. For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. How can you say, I'm not polluted? I have not gone after the Baals. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift dromedary breaking loose in her ways. A wild donkey used in the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire, in her time of mating, who can turn her away. He's basically giving two really graphic uh, descriptions of Israel. He said, you act like a camel in heat that's chasing after every male in the desert. And you act like a stinking donkey who is in heat, l running all over the town and out of control. That's how you act. And he uses that sex thing because that's what this religion involved. They were, they were prostituting themselves with these other religions. And he's just laying out. Now remember I told you the tone changed. God gets real graphic here. Because he's Laying it out, just if you don't get it, I'm going to tell you what you act like, and that's what he's basically saying. <clears throat> All those who seek her will not worry themselves. In her mouth, they will find her. Withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said, There is no hope. No, for I have loved aliens, and after them I will go. Uh, at this point in history, Judaism is dead. They're not worshiping the God of Israel, they're worshiping the Canaanite gods. And I will tell you how, let me take you back to another New Testament verse, and I'm going to bring you something. He gives them an example, if you're like a wild donkey 
out of control searching for every strange male you can find. But I'm going to take you back to the first time you see Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday. And he chooses a donkey to ride. And it is no accident. Every detail in the Bible has a reason. And I believe that donkey points back to here. When they're out of control like a wild donkey. And Jesus chooses actually a wild donkey. Well, it's a colt. It hasn't been broken. And he rides it. And he's basically saying, I'm taking Israel back. I'm controlling your desires. I'm coming into Jerusalem on a wild donkey. Totally tamed by me. And I've come to be your Messiah. Do you understand how every word, every description is, Jesus is taking this description of Israel in Jeremiah's time and he's taking it bridled and he's riding that wild donkey into Jerusalem saying, I'm the king and I came to save you. It, it, to me, the, the more you get these words and understand how in the New and Old Testament, it's crazy good. So that idiom of that unbridled lust with strangers is what God was picking apart with those two graphic pictures. Continuing on in verse 26, as the, thief, as the thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. He's basically, let me, let me tell you what he's really saying here. He says, you're ashamed because you got caught. You didn't repent. It's not repentance. You're just sad because you got caught. I caught you. They and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets, saying to a tree, you are my father. And to a stone, you gave birth to me. What he's basically saying, you've made idols of trees. You've made them of stones and you worship them. You fall down and say, oh, father, help us. And you're bowing to a stone? You're bowing down to a tree? Really? You gave birth to me. For they have turned their back to me and not their face, but in time of their trouble they will say, Arise and save us. He's basically telling them there's going to come a time. You're in that world of hurt. And you're going to cry out to me. And you're going to say, Come and save us. That's what Jeremiah is telling him. God's saying, mm -mm. Saw you. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise. If they can save you in the time of your trouble, for according to the number of your cities, are your gods, O Judah, according to historical records, every Judean city had a different idol. There were millions of Canaanite gods, and each city had its own idol. A tree and a stone became their refuge. Israel was confused about what she was worshiping, when she ascribed to the gods of fertility her very existence. And that's what God is heartbreakingly but methodically listing one by one. These are your sins. He doesn't want them to be surprised when they get taken captive. He's gonna, he has it detailed. Verse 29. Why will you plead with me? You all have transgressed against me, says the Lord. In vain I have chastened your children. They receive no correction. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O oh, generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of darkness? Why do my people say we are lords? We will come no more to you. Can a, fir uh, can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. He's giving the illusion of this. In those days when a bride would prepare herself for her wedding, depending on how rich she was, it was the custom to sew ornaments on your gown and on your, I don't know, all the attire they wore. The richer she was, the more trinkets she had. You may see some of this when you see belly dancers now. They kind of have the trinkets and stuff. But it was the custom in those days that a bride would spend the whole year where she was betrothed gaining more ornaments. And when boy, when she came out, she was decked. Now she was poor. She probably didn't have as many. And, and, and they took quite a bit of um, carefulness doing that. I mean, that was, that was part of the ceremony. The more she had, the more loved she was by people that brought her once to sew on. So, he's basically saying, um, a bride spends a lot of time on her attire and, and, and her ornaments, but yet you have for, forgotten me. 
you forgot me. You haven't put one ornament on for me. And so I think if you could be really technically uh, detailed here, God wants to be your ornament. I know that sounds weird, but the way I read that is He wants you to wear Him. He wants you to be loud. Well, that's been our theme this year in, in our women's group, but I think it's what He's saying here. Put me on. Make me obvious to everyone that sees you. Wear me on your sleeve. Wear me on your skirt bottom. Wear me on your hat. And if people ask, what is it that you're smiling about? Tell them. He's your ornament. And I think he says, you've forgotten. They've, Judas forgotten me. I'm not their ornament anymore. But I really think he's saying to us, he wants us to wear him out loud and, and, and be bold about it. Verse 33, why do you beautify your way to seek love? Therefore you have also taught the wicked women your ways. That goes back to this harlotry. Also in your skirts is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocents. That refers back to sacrificing the babies and killing them. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly on all things. Yet you say, because I'm innocent, surely his anger shall turn for me. Behold, I will plead my case against you. Remember, he's being the defense while you're here. Because you say, I've not sinned. Why do you gad about so much to change your way? Also, you shall be ashamed of Egypt as you were ashamed of Assyria. Indeed, you will go forth from him with your hands on your head. I want to stop there. Both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom tried to escape being uh, captive. Of course, they did. And they would go to Egypt and try to get help. And then the southern kingdom would go to Syria and try to get help. And God says, ah, no, 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 no. Nice try. You can't escape this. And when it says... And it says, shall go forth from him with your hands on your head. That's captivity. They made them put their hands either behind them or on their head, and they were taken out in chains naked. That is a picture of Judah being taken captive, hands on head, being led out by King Nebuchadnezzar. He said, you can't escape. You can't go to Egypt. You can't go to Assyria and escape this. You are done. Imagine why Jeremiah was not a popular prophet, can you? For the Lord has rejected your trusted allies. In other words, he's rejected Egypt. He's rejected Assyria. Nice try. They're not going to help you. And you will not prosper by them. They're going into captivity, and that's the warning. Now that finishes, that sums up chapter 2. So we got a kind of a um, court case where God pled his case and told me why. It's going to happen, and exactly, he ends up with, you're going to be taken away with your hands on your head. So let's continue on in Jeremiah 3. I'm in verse 1. They say, if a man divorces his wife, and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. Now here's where you're going to find a little bit of a dichotomy. The Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, the Mosaic Law basically says, I gave you the scripture if you want to read it, basically says if a man divorces his wife and she marries another, he may not ever remarry her again. That's the Mosaic Law. They know this. Now what God is saying basically to Israel is you're my wife, but I'm going to divorce you. You're a harlot. You're... You're cheating on me, but if you will repent, you can come back to me. What many scholars say is, oh, God wouldn't have written that. Jeremiah messed that up. No, God knows exactly what he's saying here. Remember I told you before, we're beginning to get a picture of the Messiah. The only way that could work is if someone paid the price for that sin. So that God could not see it again. The only way he could remarry her is if the sin was blotted out. As if she had never divorced him. And the only way that sin can be blotted out is by the blood of Jesus. So we're getting to get a picture of God saying, Yeah, I'm going to divorce you now. But there's going to come a time when I'm going to send my son and he's going to offer you such mercy that I'm going to look at you at brand new. And I'm going to remarry you. That's why at the very end of time, when you look down the pike to King Jesus coming back in Revelation 19, the big white war horse is stepping down and rescuing Israel from Petra 
That's because they call out to him. Hosea 5.15 says they'll call out to me. They call out to him and they ask forgiveness. And he washes them white as snow so that when he looks down on them in Petra, Jesus, see God's, Jesus sees God's wife, the bride of God that he's coming to rescue. And he, by golly, steps off that big white war horse and takes his father's bride to safety. And so when you begin to understand that God's making a way here, he's going against Mosaic law and saying, yeah, I'll remarry you because you'll be brand new. You won't be the same person. That's a picture and a hint of Jesus that's coming. That's, that's what I love this. I love the fact that we get to see Jesus. I remember I told you early on when you first started with me five years ago, if I had another hundred years to live, I would pick apart every verse in the Bible and tell you that Jesus is in it because I think he is. He's in every, every part of the Bible. I'm in verse 2, continuing on. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see. Where have you not lain with men? By the road you have sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness. And you have polluted the land with your harlot trees and your wickedness. That's a little more graphic than what even the... Some of the King James whitewashes that a little bit. He's basically, if you go back to the original text, he basically says you've been raped by all of these idols. They've taken advantage. You've been raped. You didn't just have sex with them. You were ravished. That's what the real word means there. So it's violence. These idols, he said, you chose them over me. I can't figure it out, God says. Uh, verse 3. Therefore, the showers have been withheld, and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Will you not from this time cry to me for my father? You are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you were able. That basically means as you were able. Anything you thought. That's how it should, should be translated. You have done every evil thing that you thought of, that your mind could think of. And yet I was the God that sent you here. And I'm going to tell you, this may be a hard lesson, but I'm a literalist. And he says in this section that I withheld the rain from you because you sinned. Now, I don't know if you want to go there or not. I don't know if you've been watching California lately. And it's not my words. You can take this verse and you can lay this anywhere. If there's a drought, is God withholding the rain? Yeah, he is. He says so. And he says he withholds it because of sin. Now, you can place that California, you can place that Kansas. I'm just saying, I think we have to be literal about this. And what he did in Jeremiah's day, he's doing today. I am God. I do not change. So if you see areas that are really drought-ridden and burning up, I'd say look to the sin. That's what Jeremiah says. Believe it or not. I am. It's not my book. Verse 6. The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king. This is how you know when we are. He's pretty good about chronicling where we are in history. Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree. And there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. Probably one of the saddest phrases in this whole section but she did not return five words, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Here he's using a different idiom for them. <coughs> Judah and Israel as, as sinful sisters. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretives, says the Lord. Here's a really sad part that you have to understand. The northern kingdom, the two treacherous sisters, 
northern kingdom and the southern. Northern kingdom's already been taken captive, been gone 150 years. The southern kingdom should have known better. They had 150 years. They had Isaiah. They had Amos. They had Joel. They had Daniel. They had Jeremiah. Check the list of prophets God sent into the southern kingdom. And basically God said, you're worse. You're worse than your horrible sister to the north because you should have known better. I, you had 150 years to get it right and you still are worse. I think he's, he's so upset and ha has a perfect right to be. He reminds me of the, this language reminds me of Revelation 3 when the Apostle John writes the letter to the Laodicean church, uh, a.k.a. America. I wish that you were cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm, I want to spit you out. This is the same theme. You should have known better, America. You should be hot. You should. You're nothing. And this is what happened to the Southern Kingdom. After 150 years of watching what happened to the Northern Kingdom, they didn't learn anything. They did not learn anything. They did not change. Judah, therefore, then, to me, in my opinion, is worse than the northern kingdom of Israel because she saw what Israel did and what the recompense could have been and she chose not to do it. She is worse off. And I really think taking that back to my theme about marrying it to Revelation 3 in the Laodicean church, America is going to be far worse off than other nations who didn't have the opportunities we had. We should have known better. We have the means. We have the knowledge. We've seen what God can do, and we've chosen not to follow him. We should have known better. I think it's our theme, too. Verse 11, Then the Lord said to me, Backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful. Hint, hint, we're starting to see Jesus come says the Lord, I will not remain angry forever. When, is he, when does he cease his angry? When the Bethlehem star appears over a little stable and a baby's first cry cries out so that the angels in heaven open their, their wings and their voices and sing to the whole earth, he is born. That's when God ceases to be angry forever. He sends his son. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord God. There is that tree reference. You understand what that means now. Uh, verse 14. Return, O backsliding children. He keeps wanting them back. He wants to forgive them. Says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Now, this prophet is going to do what every prophet does. They preach to, the, to their near future, to the people that are sitting around them around the campfire. They're telling them this. But then he's going to do just what Isaiah does so eloquently. He's going to take you past another 3,000 years. He's going to take you to the birth of Jesus and... 2,000 years passed, on into the millennium. We don't know how long it's going to be. We know it's at this point, from when he wrote this, he's about 2,600 years past that. And he may be a little bit further. Jesus hasn't come back yet. But he's taking him to the millennial kingdom when every nation will understand who God is and they will come to worship him in Jerusalem. Read what he says. You'll get the millennial kingdom picture here. You know this from Ezekiel because it's that same type of writing. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with the knowledge and understanding. And basically he says, I'm going to remarry you. And I told you the only way he can do that in Mosaic Law is he can change them till they are brand new. He can't marry a harlot. He can't. That's God. But he can marry somebody who takes on the blood of Jesus so that when he looks at them, he 
throws their sin into the deepest sea and he sees a new creation. That's who Israel be. That's who the remnant is that flees to Petra. They found Jesus. They aren't harlots anymore. They're seeking the Messiah and they've accepted Jesus. And when he looks at them, he sees that new creature. He doesn't see the old one. That's how he can marry them again. That's how he can say, I'm married to you because they're now a new creature. And he's beginning to hint now, you're going to walk with me into the millennium. This is what pro all prophets do that. They jump around, but you be careful of that language. You understand that because it's very millennial sounding. Jeremiah 3 8 let's, says that he was divorced, and now he's saying he's going to be re remarried. God was willing to ignore the previous divorce if they would return to him and accept his son and be a new creation, as we all can be. God doesn't look at me and think, oh, I hate what she did 50 years ago. Looks at me and says, but she's mine now. She's mine now. I don't see that. I see Jesus. When God looks at me, he sees Jesus. Thank God. I mean, we all are imperfect people, and that's what he's giving Israel the right. He's sending the Messiah for Israel. Verse 16. Then it shall come to pass, when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days. This is the millennial kingdom in those days. Millennial kingdom, says the Lord, that they will say no more. I want you to do a heads up on this next verse. I think it will change your mind about some funny things that are happening here. Then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in those days to the Lord, that they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. At that time Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all... Circle, circle, circle. The nation shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their heart. John 3.16 is an earth changer. So is Jeremiah 3.16. Jeremiah is looking in the millennium. He said, there is no Ark of the Covenant. It shall be no more. Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm sorry. You got it wrong. This says there's no Ark to find. He said, they will not find it. It is no more. Now, you can take that literally and say, well, that's not really what he means. He really means it's lost and people can't find it. Well, he says it'll be no more. If you've ever considered that maybe it's hidden in Ethiopia, maybe it's here, I want you to consider Jeremiah 3.16. And it's definitely not going to be in any place in the Millennial Kingdom. We've looked at that temple. And because the ark was in the mercy seat, there, there doesn't need to be that. Jesus Christ himself is the presence in that temple. We don't need a mercy seat. The mercy man is there. We don't need an ark of the covenant. We've got the Messiah that reigns. And Jeremiah says, quit worrying about the ark. It is no more. I think that's an interesting verse because if, hmm. if you're a treasure hunter, I think you've been wasting your time looking for it. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, we don't need that. We don't need those religious, I'd say, articles in the millennium because we have Jesus Christ himself. Um, if you're interested, the ark first shows up in Exodus 25. That's just a fact you might, if you want to go back and review it. But we're getting a new covenant. Those of you studying Ezekiel with me, you know that. That new, that new temple, we got Jesus in the midst. We don't need an ark. And that's what Jeremiah is saying. Verse 18 now. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. In other words, Israel's going to be, in the millennium, there's going to be all 12 tribes. There's not going to be separated anymore. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land which I've given as an inheritance to your fathers. But I said, how can I put you among the children and give you a pleasant land, a beautiful heritage of the hosts of the nations? And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from me. This is the millennial kingdom. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherous with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. He keeps lamenting this. This was a big deal to God. He was cheated on. I've never been cheated on. My husband's probably sitting there. I don't know how that feels. But it's one of the most horrible things in all the earth. And God himself feels that hurt right here. His wife cheated on him. But he made a way because of his son. And he's going he's to take her back. 
Verse 23, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Israel will come to the Lord Jesus Christ before the millennial kingdom. The, the remnant will come in the tribulation time. For shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our reproach covers us. There were terrible, terrible sins they committed. Lying down in the fields and the green trees, horrible, horrible. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth even to this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. There's a interesting, interesting thing you should know, and I believe I've taught this to you before, but you know me, if I find a good verse, I just never get enough of it. King David says something so intriguing that I want to lay it here because he's so God is so upset about them worshiping these idols and these false gods. And we might even say these fallen angels, which I think probably that's who Baal and Shemosh and those were. But King David nails it pretty good. And I'm going to read to you one of my favorite explanations of this. And you may have it. If you don't, it should be in your treasury of verses that you can pull from. It's Psalm 115, 4 through 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Basically, David says, you become exactly like the idol you worship. You, you worship Shemosh, who burns babies on his bronze arms. And Moloch, you sacrifice your children to. You're just like them. You become a baby killer. You worship the Canaan gods of Baal who think sex brings life and energy to you. You become a despot. You become something so despicable no one can stand you and you get riddled with disease and you are thrown off like a harlot because you are a harlot. You become exactly like the idol you worship. You love money. You love actors. You love football. I'm going to take it back to modern times. You love your device. You're just like that. If that's your idol, King David said 700 years before Jesus was born, that's who you are. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with football and baseball and devices. I'm saying if they're your idols. That's what David said. If you don't like the, those words, you'll have to argue with King David in the millennium. He's going to be a prince. Jeremiah 4, verse 1. If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved, and you shall swear. The Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. He's giving his people a chance to repent. Here's something you may not have thought about before. He goes, verse 2, and you swear the Lord lives. Let me just throw this out, and I want you to mull on it. You don't have to answer me now, but think about it. How many people have ever heard someone cuss? I mean, that would be 100% of us. Okay. And you've all heard people take God's name in vain. We all have. Has anyone ever heard anyone take Buddha's name in vain? Or Confucius's name in vain? Or Harry Krishna's name in vain? Or even all his name. They don't cuss by that. They cuss by God. And what he's saying in a twisted way, if you go back to the original Hebrew here, he's saying, you're swearing by my name, which in a strange way shows that you know I have power. Because they don't swear against their idols. They don't, they don't say, oh, Baal, oh, doggone Baal. But they would say, oh, blank, blank, God. And he's saying, what you're really doing is acknowledging that.
that I am powerful. The others have no power. And that's kind of the twist. And it's it, You have to read the Hebrew to get that. But God has a sense of humor. The Holy Spirit puts those little puns in so that we kind of chuckle a little bit. And I'm in verse 3. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire. See, that's that fire and burning again. And burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Now, I want to underline another word because I'm a nitpicker and because I like detail. The word thorns. That's the idiom he uses here. When thorns were promised to Adam, it was when he was thrown out of the garden. They'd never seen thorns before. And God said, I will make your, you know, your ground hard and you'll be filled with thorns. In other words, it, God cursed the earth. When he threw Adam out. You knew that. And that thorns is representative of that. You do understand when Jesus went to the cross. He took a crown of thorns. Because he was saying to the majesties of the earth. The devils. The earth is mine again. The crown of thorns has a real meaning. And this meaning here. Again we begin to see a picture of Jesus. When Jesus took on that crown of thorns. He's saying to the devils. I'm taking back the earth. It's mine. Love it. Verse 5, declare to in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpet in the land. I want you to underline that knowing this is the representative to the trumpet judgments in Revelation. We are now, like all prophets do, remember he's taking you to the millennium. Now he's going to backtrack you and he's going to get you uh, to look a little bit about the judgments that are going to happen during the Revelation tribulation period. That's a rep that is a reference to the tribulation trumpet judgments. Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves. And let us go into the fortified city. Set up the standard towards Zion. Take refuge. Do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. Remember the kings of the north come down. This is the trumpet judgments in Revelation. We don't have time to go into that today, but that's a good review to look that back up. It's in Revelation 8 and 9 if you're interested. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the nation. Who, who goes about the earth like a roaring lion, seeking who he may destroy? You know his name. The old adversary, the old dragon, the old serpent, devil. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. <coughs> he has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities, this is a picture of the tribulation. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. For this, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament, and wail. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. This is starting also to describe the near future, which will be the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, who is also called the lion. He takes it to the near future. You're going to be taken captive by the old lion, Nebuchadnezzar. And then he says, and in the future, Israel is going to be taken down by the lion who roars the devil. Uh, prophets do that. They do near future and then they jump way far. Just be able to pick both of those apart. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish and the heart of the princes. Remember how many kings were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, all of them. Remember Zedekiah meets a really bad end. <coughs> his, his, um, sorry. His sons are killed in front of his eyes. And then, <clears throat> and then his eyes are are poked out. So he's he's kind of pointing to that, and he's saying, "Of the heart of the princes, the priests shall be astonished, <clears throat> and the prophets shall wonder." And I and then I said, "Oh Lord God, surely you have greatly deceived this people and have Jerusalem saying, you shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches in the heart.'" Um, take a look at verse ten. This is one verse in the Bible. And I can tell you, I don't know how many commentaries I looked at. Uh, several. Maybe close to a dozen. Can't explain this verse. I'm going to give you my best shot at it. And I'm going to tell you it's poor. Because no one gets it. Maybe you will ask the Holy Spirit. Do you want to read it again to you? I'm going to tell you what I think it means. Knowing it's a Lindaism. Verse 10. Then I said, Ah, oh Lord God, surely you have greatly deceived this people. And Jerusalem, saying, You shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches to the heart. 
The problem with that is God does not deceive. Jeremiah saying, surely God, you've deceived. What I think in the translation happened here, there were false prophets prophesying at the time of Jeremiah, saying, you're going to have peace. Don't listen to Jeremiah. You're not going to be taken captive. You're Jerusalem. God won't destroy the temple. Yada, yada, yada. They said that. I think that's what that means. The closest I can come going back to original languages, nobody gets it very well because we know God's not a deceiver. But we know there were false, false, da -da -da -da, false prophets who could not tell the truth, saying they were prophesying in God's name, that were lying to the people. I think that's what that means. You can mull that over and, and dig into that if you want to. That's as good as I can get with that, guys. Sorry. I do know God does not deceive. But then again, I'm a literalist, so take that for what you mean. Verse 11. At that time it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of desolate heights blows in the wilderness toward the da daughter of my people, not to fan or to cleanse, a wind too strong for those these who will come for me, now I will also speak judgment against them. This is the Holy Spirit, Ruach. The name for wind, this word is Ruach. Spirit, the Spirit's going to come like a dry parched land is going to really war against you. You're going to be taken captive. You're, gonna, you're not going to win. I love you. I've divorced you. And there's going to be some crummy things that are going to happen to you. And I'm sending the Holy Spirit... And the Holy Spirit, rock, the wind, is going gonna, is gonna to help the enemies. That's what's going to happen. God used Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon for his own purpose. He does it all the time in the Bible. He'll take what's evil and he'll use that to bring about what's good. And he does that all the time. And this is what he's saying. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and we're going to bring up Nebuchadnezzar and we're going to come up against you. It's going to be a wind too strong, too strong for you to withstand. Behold, he shall come up like clouds, and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you for a voice declares from Dan? That's northern kingdom, by the way. And proclaims affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make mention to the nations, yes, proclaim against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and raise their voice against the cities of Judah like keepers of a field there against her all around because she has been rebellious against me, says the Lord, your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter, because it reaches to your heart. Um. Watchers come from a far country. Interesting phrase God uses there. Watchers are a type of angels. We see them in Daniel show up to declare Nebuchadnezzar will be like a beast for seven years. They are often sent on missions of intelligence. And it looks to me like God sending unseen realm beings and to set up what's going to happen. That's what it looks like to me. I'm a literalist. He said, watchers are coming. That's who they are. Read Daniel and you'll be more familiar with that term. Oh, my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart. You'll notice how often God's going to use this heart reference here. He's. This is a tearjerker, really. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace. Because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried for the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children. And they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Um, God is so upset with these people. 
he and I remember I told you it's like a court case, and he's laid out every evil thing they've done. It's sometimes two or three times he's mentioned it. The more times he mentions it, the more upset he is. Remember, this is God speaking through Jeremiah, telling that you're evil, you're evil, you're evil, and you have stabbed me in the heart, in the heart, in the heart. I always say if God says it once, pay attention. If he says it twice or three times, heads up. He's mentioned his heart several times. This is really hard for God that these people did this. Very, very, very hard. Verse 23, I beheld the earth. Oh, this is a, just a note, a side note. Now, this is not my words, but several commentators had the exact same phrase. Verses 23 through 26 is, I'm going to do quote, quote. This is a direct quote. One of the most forceful prophetic chapter sections in the whole Bible. And it is readily understood to be very, very important. So, heads up for 23, 23 through 26. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form. That takes you back to Genesis 1. He's taking you back to the beginning. And void. And the heavens, they had no light. Remember when God starts the whole story? I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. Does this sound to you like Revelation? When everything trembles from Genesis to Revelation, he's going to give you the story here. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land, which is Israel, was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. wonder when this is. He says, from Genesis to Revelation. I really believe at the end of the tribulation period, if you're a Revelation studier, they, Paul, John, and Isaiah all say the earth shakes to and fro like a drunkard. And, and the mountains are dissolved like wax, and the whole earth changes. I believe this is what Jeremiah is seeing. He's seeing this is how fierce God's anger is. And he's taking it clear to the end of the tribulation when the earth is destroyed. If you read Revelation 6, I mean, the heavens roll up like a scroll. It looks like everything turns topsy-turvy and... Mountains are no more. Islands have disappeared. I think we're getting a little brief picture 600 years before John wrote um, the Revelation. And I think Jeremiah and John are seeing the same picture. I think you can lay them side by side. In other words, dire, dire, dire. This is not a good warning what's going to happen to Israel if she does not repent. And we do know in the tribulation, two-thirds of Israel does not repent. One-third gets saved, but that's not a very good percentage. Two-thirds don't. So they get destroyed when this earth-shaking things happen, and they will be destroyed. And that's not, I wouldn't want to go with the 33% percentage. That's not a very good percentage, but that's what God says happens. We have Day of the Lord passages in similar places. 2 Peter 3, verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved. Does this sound like the same period? Being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according, and that's, listen to what he says about us. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The millennium. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. If you worry about the tribulation, you read Second Peter because he gives you the promise. Revelation 21, 1, Now I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Isaiah 65, 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered to come to mind. Jeremiah basically, in his poetic rendition of God's trial, telling you the same story that his other prophets saw, we don't have to worry about that earth-shaking fire event from the trumpets and the bold judgments. We don't have to. We won't be there. But we have friends that we're worried about. That's why we worry, because we want them to be with us. Going on to verse 27, For thus says the Lord, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. 
For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken. I have purposed and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. This is the end of times, guys. Uh, some prophets call it time of Jacob's trouble. We call it the tribulation. They shall go into thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in the whole earth shakes. Paul says in Romans 8.20, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the, cre the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. I love that. Paul says that we have so polluted this earth with the blood of the innocents, and I think of the babies and all, that it groans. It, the earth itself is crying out to God to redeem it. And the only way he can redeem it is with fire. And that's what's going to happen in the tribulation. It's going to be burnt to a crisp so that a new heaven and new earth can be formed. Right now the earth is groaning to God. I didn't make that up. Paul says that. And I think it makes sense of the atrocities that have happened on this earth. This earth is groaning under the horrible things that have happened. I love that. You should have that verse marked uh, in Romans for your memory. Continue on verse 30. And when you are plundered, what will you do? God's saying, and when you're taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be, what will you do? So he's taking him back now to the near future. Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. In other words, demons don't really like you. And those false gods you worshipped are demons. They will kill you. And if you are worshipping fallen angels, they will kill you too. They don't like you. For I have heard a voice as a voice of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child. This reminds me of John talking in Revelation again. The voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spreads her hands saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. You become like the idols you worship. You worship Shemosh and Moloch who demanded the blood of your innocent children. And now you are like them. Because of murders at you. Now, if you're a little depressed by this section, don't be. <clears throat> because I think we, I tried to point out to you that in the midst of God plaintively setting up his case... I think he did a fine job laying out his case and telling why he's angry and what they did wrong. I think in the hints of the sections that are glimmering out, you see a picture of Jesus. I think we see the promise starting to come back that I will marry you again if you return to me. And we begin to know that he couldn't do that in Mosaic and Law unless they were a new creation. That's the promise of Jesus coming. We begin to look into the lineage where he says, and you will go with me, all the tribes, into the millennium with him. So we put it all together and we begin to see Jeremiah has the same story, has the same message that Ezekiel said, that Isaiah said, that Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and Micah and Nahum and Habakkuk and Daniel, the greats of the greats, Ezekiel, they all had the same message because it's written by the same author. In a lineage of time where he looked down on a people that had forsaken him, that couldn't find him, that would never come back to him unless he sent a Messiah. And if he could send a Messiah that could shed his blood for the remission of their sin, he could look past their sin and see his son could take them back and that's the story guys that's why when you put the whole bible together revelation begins to make sense the tribulation is not for the church you're saved you're out of here you're jesus's bride the tribulation is to bring god's bride back to bring israel back so that he can look at them 
as a new creation and be married to them. Most modern day Christians don't get that. Never be deceived. Never let anyone tell you that, well, you, we don't think we're so good. We have to go through the tribulation. I'm sorry, you're not good. But you're saved by the blood of a Savior. That when God looks at you, he sees him. And he's not going to put him through the tribulation. I mean, it's just that simple. I have a couple of promises for you. Always. Jeremiah has some of my favorites. 29.13 And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Love that one. I think the New Covenant, I'm going to end with reading the New Covenant to you because we've talked a lot about Mosaic Covenant and old laws and all that. But this is this is the New Covenant. We're going to get it in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah is a jewel. Not that I don't love it all, but we are going to spend some time on that treasure. But here's what it says in the 31st verse of 31 Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And if anyone ever says to you, God has replaced the church with Israel, you take him to Jeremiah 31, the 31st verse, and you say, that's not true. Because God loves them with an undying love, and he's going to make a brand new covenant, and they're going to be his. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the blessed, wonderful words of our hero, Jeremiah. And I ask, Lord, if anyone listening to this does not know you as Savior, that they would seek you and find you this very night. Oh, God, we pray for souls for the kingdom because we know you're coming soon. Ready our hearts, ready our minds that we might be prepared to witness always of the reason of the hope that's in us. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.